Hello and welcome to MK's Secrets of Neurophysiology. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at neurophysiology topics in depth. Today we're going to be continuing talking about the somatosensory system. This is indeed part two. If you haven't yet checked out part one, I will leave a card at the end of this video so that you can actually go out and check that video. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment, and grab your piece of paper paper and your pen and let's So in our previous review lecture video, we looked at receptors and neurons. We looked at the different types of receptors, mechanoreceptors, uh, pain receptors, temperature receptors. We also looked at the different neurons and the classification of the neurons, the parts of the neurons that are uh, essential for this uh, topic. Now, if you haven't yet understood that video, this will sound like Greek to you. So please pause the video at this moment and please go and watch that video right now. Then in this review lecture video, we're going to be looking at predominantly the sensory pathways, the ascending pathways, the sensory homunculus and cortical plasticity. If you haven't yet revised your concepts that you learned at third year concerning action potentials and the propagation of the action potentials, including propagation of action potentials across the synapse, please find some time to do that. I will be re releasing some videos on the third year topics on uh, general physiology. So please tell your friend to subscribe to this and uh, we will be covering more ground on the clinical topics, both preclinical as well as clinical topics. So we shall continue by talking about the somatosensory system. Remember that almost all the sensory information that's going to be coming from the somatic segments of the body is going to be entering through the spinal cord through what is referred to as a dorsal nerve root. Now, before I actually explain what's going on here, I want to draw something for you so that you can understand exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm going to show you a black screen and we'll draw that from scratch, okay? And so that we can be able to follow me each and every single step. So let's say this is your spinal cord, okay? This is your spinal cord over there, okay? Now, this is obviously going to be my posterior aspect, the aspect that is facing up. I will tell you how, how to know that this is the posterior aspect and how to know that this is the anterior aspect. So this is going to be my posterior aspect on the, uh, superior, on the superior side. Then on the inferior side, this is going to be my anterior aspect here. This is going to be my right side. Remember what is right on the screen is going to be left in real life. And what is left on the screen is going to be right in real life. Same thing as when you're reading a CT scan. Same thing when you're reading x-rays. So this side here is going to be my left side. Okay, so here you have the right side. Here you have the left side. Now, on the posterior aspect, there is a sulcus here, which is known as the median sulcus. So this is what is referred to as the median sulcus, which I will abbreviate as M. S. So this is your median sulcus. Then anteriorly, you have a groove, which is known as the median groove, okay, MG, or the anterior groove. Okay, so you have a median sulcus, and you have a groove anteriorly. Now, remember that the spinal cord is going to be consisting of gray matter and white matter. Remember that gray matter is a collection of cell bodies, and the gray is because of the presence of the nasal substance. And then the white matter is going to be the collection of axons. So the gray matter in the spinal cord is going to be found on the inner aspect. The white matter is going to be found on the outer aspect. So it's shaped more or less like a balloon, okay? Or rather a butterfly, not a balloon, a butterfly. So this is how it's going to be looking like. So I hope you're following my drawing on the screen. I know it may not be so artistic, but if it is and you find it artistic and more representative of what I'm trying to get the point across, then you're welcome. So this butterfly, assume that this is a butterfly. If you don't know what a butterfly looks like, then I don't know what you're doing here. So you have a central canal here in the center. 
okay? So these projections here are known as horns. This projection at the back is known as the dorsal horn. So dorsal horn, DH, okay? Or you, this projection here also is going to be referred to as the dorsal horn. So DH, whatever you have on the right side is the same thing that's what you're going to be having on the left side. Then here on the anterior side, this is known as the anterior horn. You're going to be calling this AH, okay? So you have the dorsal horn and you have the anterior horn. The dorsal horn is going to be purely sensory. So there's just going to be sensory impulses there. Then the anterior horn is going to be purely motor. So there's just going to be motor uh, impulses there. Then in some segments of the spinal cord, especially those that are associated with the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, you have a lateral horn, which is found in these areas here, you know, in the thoracic region, as well as the first lumbar region, you may have a lateral horn, but I'm not really interested in the lateral horn. And then of course, the surrounding areas of this are going to be the white matter. So arising from the posterior aspect from this dorsal horn, you have a root, which is known as the dorsal nerve root. So this is going to be a dorsal nerve root on this side. You're going to have another dorsal nerve root coming out from this side. Okay, so you have the dorsal nerve root. Now this dorsal nerve root has a swelling, which is known as the dorsal nerve root ganglion. Remember when we say that a ganglion is a collection of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, Nuclei are a collection of cell bodies in the central nervous system. So this is going to be a dorsal nerve root ganglion. And remember that the dorsal nerve root is purely going to be consisting of sensory fibers. Take note of that, that the dorsal nerve root is purely going to be consisting of sensory fibers. So there are no motor fibers that you're going to be finding inside this dorsal nerve root. Then arising from the anterior aspect you have what is known as the anterior nerve root this one does not have any swelling so this has an anterior nerve root and the anterior nerve root is going to be purely motor so it's going to be consisting of only motor fibers so they are only motor fibers that you're going to be finding in the anterior nerve root now these nerve roots are going to merge and once they merge they're going to form spinal nerves so this is how a spinal nerve is going to be formed so they're going to merge on this side, they're going to merge on the left side, they're going to merge on the right side, and they're going to be forming a spinal nerve. So what I have drawn here is what is referred to as a spinal nerve. So now the spinal nerve is going to be consisting of both sensory input and it's also going to be consisting of uh, motor input. The spinal nerves are eventually going to divide into an anterior and a posterior ramus. Remember, ramus is coming from the word branch, so it's going to be an anterior branch coming to the anterior aspect, a posterior branch going to the posterior aspect, and you have other smaller branches here, which are known as rami communicante, which are rather, uh, in English, referred to as communicating branches. So as you can see here, you have, this is your typical drawing of your spinal nerve. So suppose you have, let's say, a receptor that is here. So I will put this receptor as this circle that I have drawn. Let's say this is a Pacinian scopasco. So this Pacinian scopasco is going to be joined by a first order neuron or an, a nerve that's eventually going to be carrying this impulse into the spinal cord, into the communicating branches, through the ramus, and then eventually it's going to be going through the dorsal nerve root. And remember that the uh, ganglion is going to be found in this area here. So you're going to be having the ganglion of this nerve here and it's going to be entering through the dorsal uh, nerve root um, over there going into your tracts there. So remember that there are sections of the spinal cord. So this section as I alluded to in the earlier uh, slides um, here that I've shaded here in red, I think there's too much red on the screen. Let's use a blue uh, color so that it doesn't blot out everything. So here you have the dorsal. What I'm tracing over in blue, you have the dorsal uh, medial tract where all the sensory information that is being carried from the modern sensations is going to be carried. And then over here in this area, you have the anterolateral um, uh, tracts where the both motor as well as sensory information is going to be carried out. So this is a typical basic outlay of your typical spinal nerve. So let's get back to the slides and see what we have to say. As you can see here on the slides, you have this as your posterior um, uh, 
median sulcus this is your anterior groove you have your dorsal horn your anterior horn and your lateral horns you have your central uh, canal there then you have your dorsal nerve root you have your dorsal nerve root ganglion or you can refer to it as a spinal ganglion you have your anterior or your ventral nerve root and then this is eventually going to join and form a spinal nerve that can divide into a ventral ramus and a dorsal ramus so an anterior ramus and a posterior ramus and then these are eventually going to divide into further communicating branches so if you understand this basic basic explanation of the spinal uh, nerves then it's going to make the pathways and talking about the pathways a bit whole lot easier so there are two major pathways that we alluded to in the previous lecture there is what is referred to as the dorsal column or the medial and meniscal system this is going to be carrying the modern sensations remember the highway that we talked about we will compare these two systems and we see the differences and the similarities that are present because on your exams you may sometimes be asked to compare and contrast between the two systems then you have an anterolateral column which is obviously going to be carrying primitive sensations you can remember the dirt road that we talked about in the earlier video uh, when we're talking about the receptors and the neurons then here's another diagram that i also showed you in the previous slides this is just simply telling you the dorsal column here and you have the anterolateral column here and remember that the gray matter that's found in the spinal cord can actually be divided into sections which are known as lamina okay so it's divided into layers you have layer one or lamina one lamina two lamina three lamina four lamina five lamina six lamina seven uh, lamina eight and lamina nine so you have layers and depending on which system you're involving you have different uh, neurons or different tracks moving within these layers and they have different functions of course we will cover uh, most of these as we move on further with the course of the syllabus but for now know that there are different layers in the gray matter so here's some bit of contrast between the two systems so remember we have two main systems a dorsal medial system and an anterolateral system so the dorsal medial system is only going to be consisting of sensory fibers so it's only going to be containing ascending fibers while it's the anterolateral system is going to be consisting of both ascending and descending fibers so it means it's going to be consisting of both sensory as well as motor fibers the dorsal system, on the other hand, is going to be transmitting modern sensations. We'll talk of the different sensations in which are carried in the dorsal system. And then the anterolateral system is going to be transmitting primitive sensations. Then the axons that are found in the dorsal system are very large and they are myelinated, meaning that they're going to be carrying these impulses at very fast speeds. They can actually reach as high as 110 meters per second from about 30 to 110 meters per second. While as the axons on the anterolateral system are much smaller in comparison to the ones in the dorsal medial system and they have velocities of about 40 meters per second the organization and spatial orientation in the dorsal medial lemniscal system is very high remember in your when you're on a highway everything is pretty organized the lines cars know where they're supposed to be and cars know where they're supposed to move and you can't have uh, a car moving in the opposite direction while it's in the anterolateral column, the spatial organization is not so well. And then in the dorsal medial uh, lemniscal tract, the nerves are going to decussate. When I talk about decussate, you can just think of this quote unquote as crossing over to the opposite side. Remember that we have a left side and you have a right side. Nerves can sometimes cross over from the left side to the right side or from the right side to the left side. The crossing over of these nerves or the crossing over of these tracts or the decussation of these tracts in the dorsal medial lemniscal system happens at the level of the medulla, while as the crossing over at the anterolateral column happens at the level of the spinal cord. These are just some of the contrasting differences that are present between the two systems. One major similarity is that most of these systems are going to be converging in the thalamus. If you remember from our first lecture, we say that the thalamus is going to be acting as a relay center. So it's going to be receiving both the sensory information and transmitting it to the brain, as well as um, some motor information and transmitting it to the peripheries of the body. And remember that the thalamus also has ability to process some information, as we shall see that the thalamus can process things like pain later on during this lecture. So what are some of the sensations that are going to be carried out by the dorsal column? You have touch sensation that is obviously going to be requiring a high degree of localization of the stimulus. You have two-point discrimination, which is the ability, of course, to differentiate two points that are close together on the skin and not perceive them as one. 
Then you have uh, touch sensations that are going to be requiring transmission of fine graduations of uh, intensity, as well as a phasic sensation such as vibratory sensations. You have sensations that signal movements against the skin, and you also have sensation of uh, the positions of the body joints in space. You call that as proprioception. You also have pressure sensations that are related to fine degrees of judgment of pressure intensity, so what we call as fine touch. Then on the other hand, the sensations that are going to be carried by the anterolateral column include things like pain, thermal sensations, both hot and cold sensations, uh, crude touch, which is like a very, very deep uh, kind of pressure, and as well as uh, pressure sensations capable of only crude localization ability on the surface of the body. You have tickle and itch as well as sexual sensations. As we can see, most of these sensations were used by our past predecessors to actually survive and to actually evolve and adapt. So beginning with transmission at the level of the dorsal column. So I want to actually explain everything, then we'll go through it step by step with each slide so that it makes so much sense to you. So I will go back to my black screen and so that we can actually follow this step by step so that it's not really just me imposing things on you and you're not really understanding what is going on on the picture. So we shall make the picture uh, as we go. So suppose we draw a foot here. So excuse my art again. This may not look like a foot, but please imagine that it's a foot. Well, it looks like a foot somehow, somewhat. Looks like a very deformed hand. Anyways, let's say we have a feather. That's um, a feather. Okay, this is a weirdly drawn feather. So, of course, you have these touch receptors that are present here within the skin. So, suppose this feather touches uh, the skin, then these touch receptors are going to be stimulated. Remember that most of these receptors are mechanic or mechanogated receptors, meaning that whenever they're stimulated, mechano, they, they are stim they're stimulated in response to uh, stretch. So it means that some channels are going to open, and once these channels open, they allow for the influx of positive ions, causing depolarization of the receptor and initiating the action potential that's eventually going to be carried across the neuron that's going to be um, propagating this information from the receptor to the spinal cord. So... I will draw a section here of the spinal cord. Uh, it's going to be a very badly drawn section, by the way. Apologies for that. And, of course, this is going to be having your dorsal nerve root there. And then, of course, you have your spinal nerve there and your ventral root over there. So this is like a very, very poorly drawn uh, schematic diagram. But anyways, I guess it gets the point across. So you have the first order neuron, which is the one that's going to be connected to... Um, this receptor that's going to be coming from this body part and then eventually entering into the spinal um, nerve and eventually going into the dorsal uh, nerve root ganglion and then eventually it's going to be within the um, substance of the uh, spinal um, cord. Now, depending on where this is coming from, this is going to be traveling in two main structures in the dorsal column. So if it's everything below the level of T6, so everything below T6, so T6 and below, the axons are going to bundle up and form what is known as a rounded bundle, which is known as the fasculus gracilis, okay? You refer to this bundle that's going to be in the medial aspect as the fasculus gracilis. Remember that this fasculus gracilis is coming from the legs. How I remember this is you can remember that the gracilis muscle is in the legs, so obviously the fasculus gracilis is coming from the legs. Or you can actually remember that the legs are actually going to be moving in a graceful manner, so you can remember that the fasculus gracilis is coming from the leg. So they're going to bundle up in the medial aspect. So the most medial fibers on the left side as well as on the right side are going to be the fasculus gracilis. And then everything that's coming from higher levels, um, everything above T6 is going to be bundling up in, uh, let's say this is, a T, this is a T7 and it comes in, it's going to be bundling up lateral to this and this is going to be bundling up in a part which is known as the fasculus cuneatus, okay? The fasculus gracilis and the fasculus cuneatus. So these, these bundles are going to be running side by side. So you're going to be having this here from, 
the legs, the lower limbs, and then this from the upper body, which is going to be the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus, respectively from medial going to lateral. And as you are ascending from the lower part of the foot going upwards, the fibers are going to be, or the axons are going to be added to this fasciculus in a progressive manner, moving towards the lateral aspect. So it means that the ones that are coming from the foot will be most medial than the ones that are coming from the knee, for example, or the ones that are coming from the thigh, for example. So these are then going to be carrying on or moving upwards. Eventually, they are going to um, they are going to synapse, or rather, eventually they are going to go, and they are going to synapse in what is referred to as the thalamus. Remember that the thalamus is what is. Um, Rather, not, not the thalamus at this point, rather in the medulla. Remember that the medulla is the, what's going to be having certain nuclei. Remember that the collection of nuclei is, a collection of cell bodies in the central nervous system is referred to as a nuclei. Okay, correction about that. They should uh, travel and they're going to synapse in the um, medulla. So remember that in the medulla, you have predominantly four types of nuclei arranged in this manner okay you have those that are found in the medial aspect so i'll draw four of them and i'll divide the body into uh, two halves there so this is what's happening on uh, the left side this is what's happening on the right side remember the orientation that we had is the same orientation that we have even when we're doing these drawings so this nucleus which these nuclei number one and number four that are found on the lateral aspect these are called cuneate nucleus they're going to that's where the fasciculus cuneatus is going to synapse in then the ones that are found in the um midline here are known as the uh, fasciculus um or rather the grasso nucleus not fasciculus the grasso nucleus so these uh number two and number three so number two and number three are both grasso nuclei then number one and number four are both cuneate nuclei. So the cuneate nucleus is going to go and synapse in its uh its opposite um or its ipsilateral rather in its ipsilateral um nucleus that's found in the medulla and then give rise to second order neurons. Same thing is going to be happening with the fasciculus gracilis. They're going to synapse with um, the nucleus that is going to be found. They're going to synapse in the nucleus that is going to be found in um, the medulla, which is pretty much the gracile nucleus, and give rise to the second order neuron. Now, here at the level of the medulla, at the level of the medulla, this... Um, Fibers that are going to be arising from the second order neuron are going to arc, okay? They're going to arc within the medulla and cross over to the opposite side. So they're going to arc within the medulla and cross over into the opposite side. So they're going to arc within the medulla and cross over at the opposite side. So you refer to these as internal acuate fibers. So these fibers that are going to be arcing, you refer to them as internal acuate fibers. And... That means that the sensations that are going to be perceived from the left side are actually going to be perceived by the right hemisphere of the brain. And then the sensations that are going to be perceived by the right side are going to be perceived by the left hemisphere of the brain. So these are the second order neurons. The second order neurons are going to be arising at the level of the medulla, at the level of the two respective nuclei, the grasso nucleus and the uh, cuneate nucleus. And then, of course, these uh, are going to form a flattened bundle of axons, which is referred to as the medial lamniscus. So you have uh, a right medial lamniscus and you have a left medial lamniscus. So these lamniscus are going to ascend, um, obviously, and eventually uh, are going to reach the somatosensory areas. But before they reach the somatosensory area, they are going to pass through the uh, thalamus. And remember that the thalamus, once they pass through the thalamus and they synapse in the thalamus, they synapse in uh, two important nuclei. You refer to that as the ventral basal complex. They're going to synapse in the uh, ventral, uh, ventral postural uh, lateral and ventral postural medial nuclei. Then eventually... Um, these are going to proceed towards now the somatosensory areas, which happen to be found in the parietal cortex. So that's pretty much an overview of what's happening in the system. So I just want us to actually go back. I think I may have made a mistake. I just want to confirm. So this, they decassated the level of the medal. Okay, fine, great. So that's okay. So let's continue and see what this diagram has to say. So as we can see here, we have 
the fine touch over there, you have the fasciculus gracilis, which happens to be the first order neuron. And then you have another uh, an example that's coming from the finger here. So this is going to be traveling in the fasciculus cuneatus. And of course, these are going to be synapsing in the cuneate nucleus and the gracile nucleus. And eventually, these are going to be giving off second order neurons that decussate and travel in the medial laminiscal tract towards the thalamus. And then eventually in the thalamus, they're going to synapse at the ventral basal complex, both the ventral postural lateral and ventral postural medial nuclei, and eventually give rise to the third order neurons that are going to be progressing and projecting to the somatosensory cortex, which happens to be in the post-central uh, um, gyri, or you can think of this as the posterior to the central sulcus. So here is an overview uh, of the image. Take your time, pause the video, um, look at each of these steps. I shall talk about them now in much more details. So let's go at each step. So remember that the impulses are going to be generated in the receptors in the skin, muscles, tendons, joint capsules, such as the Meissner's corpuscles, Pacinian receptors, tactile discs, and all that. And then, of course, these impulses are going to be traveling along the first order neuron. And upon entering the spinal cord, the neuron is almost going to divide into two branches. It's going to divide into a medial branch and it's going to divide into a lateral branch. I think that's one detail that I forgot to mention when I was discussing this pathway. So it's going to immediately it enters into the spinal cord. It gives off a lateral branch and a medial branch. So the medial branch is going to be going medially and it's going to go upwards in the dorsal column, just like I was explaining. Then the lateral branch is going to be entering into the dorsal uh, horn of the cord gray matter. And then it's going to divide many times and provide many terminals and many synapses that are going to synapse with local neurons as well as um, intermediate neurons as well as anterior and uh, gray horn neurons in the anterior gray matter. And then eventually these are going to be serving multiple functions. So here's a, a schematic of the different neurons and, and interneurons that we're going to be finding at the level of the um, spinal cord. So what are the functions of these local neurons? So number one, they may form what is known as the spinocerebellar tract. Remember when we talk about tracts in physiology, the first part of the name is where the tract is coming from. The second part is where it's going. So spinocerebellum is obviously coming from the spinal cord going to the cerebellum. So this is obviously important in proprioception, which is the conscious perception of joints and space. Then you also uh, perform spinal reflexes. We'll talk about reflexes at one point. The reflexes are carried through this. They're, they do not reach the brain because the arc must be completed before reaching the brain. And the reason why this must happen in this way is so that your reaction time is very quick. Remember, if you re reflexes are supposed to protect you. If you put your hand on a hot plate, you don't have to think about it that you have to remove your hand. You instantly remove your hand because of that reflex. But then the majority of... Um, these are going to be off branches that are going to be entering into the dorsal column and eventually ascending to the brain, what is known as a spinal cortical tract. So the dorsal column is also referred to as the spinal cortical tract. So sometimes they may say discuss the spinal cortical tract. They are simply just talk, telling you to discuss the ascending pathways. Then remember that uh, you have spatial orientation inside the dorsal column. So in the dorsal column, the fibers that are coming from the lower parts of the body are going to be found in the center of the cord, while those that are coming from the higher segments are going to be progressively added in the lateral layers. Then, of course, in the midline, you have a bundle of axons, which forms a fasculus, which is known as a fasculus gracilis, which is going to be representing everything uh, from the legs up until T6. Then... The lateral part is going to be the fasciculus cuneatus, which is going to be representing the axons from the upper part of the trunk. So these are the two axons, the fasciculus gracilis as well as the fasciculus cuneatus. Then the ascending fibers are obviously going to move ipsilaterally and upwards uninterrupted and eventually are going to synapse with nuclei that are found in the, the dorsal part of the medulla. They're going to be synapsing with the gracile nucleus. They're going to be synapsing with the cuneate nucleus. And remember that the um, gracile nuclei are more medial, the cuneate nuclei are more lateral. Then arising from each of these nuclei are second order neurons which decussate or cross over as internal acuate fibers. And eventually they're going to be crossing over at the level of the brain stem. And these are going to be ascending upwards in what is referred to as a medial laminiscal tract. Remember that a laminiscus is a flattened bundle of axons, while the fasciculus is a rounded bundle of axons. 
at this point, you may also receive some sensory fibers that are coming from the face and via the trigeminal. Remember that the trigeminal nerve, which happens to be a cranial nerve, has three main divisions. It has a V1, V2, and V3. It has an ophthalmic, a maxillary, and a mandibular division. So these are going to be joining also the sensory input from the face at the level of the um, medial meniscal tract. So that's where uh, impulses from the face are coming from, in case you're wondering. So you have this as your medial meniscal tract here. Then through the brainstem, each of the laminiscus, like I said, is joined by fibers from the trigeminal nerve, which are going to be supplying the head. Then, of course, in the thalamus, the medial laminiscal fibers are going to be terminating in the thalamic sensory relay center, which is known as the ventral basal complex, which consists of the ventral postural lateral as well as the ventral postural medial nuclei. So VPL and the VPN, VPM nuclei. Then from these ventral basal complex, you have this third order neurons that are going to be projecting mainly to the post-central gyrus of the cerebral cortex, which is pretty much found in the parietal cortex. So you have what is known as the somatic uh, sensory area one, as well as somatosensory area two. There are also some other uh, association areas to which these projections also reach, which we will talk about shortly. So here is a schematic of the termination of this tract. And this is where... Um, what I've been talking about. So let, let me just add some annotations to this. So this is your anterior aspect here, which I shall put A. This is your posterior aspect here, which I shall put B. So follow, follow my, my green line. So where I'm drawing the outline of the green line here. So this is what is referred to as your central sulcus. So this is your central sulcus. What's this predominantly going to be dividing the uh, frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. You refer to this as your central sulcus. Now, this central sulcus, anteriorly here, you have the motor area, which is here. The motor, the primary motor cortex is anterior to the central sulcus. Posterior, you have somatosensory area one, somatosensory area two. As you can see, there are different parts that are represented on this somatosensory area. As you can see, the thigh is represented here, the thorax here, the neck, the uh, shoulders, the hand, the fingers, the tongue, intra-abdominal, the face, the arm, and the legs. You find out that the whole body is actually represented in the brain such that impulses coming from different areas are actually going to be projecting to be a specific representative um, representations in the uh, cortex. So that's how you're able to now know that someone has touched my foot and not my hand. So you call that as a homunculus, a sensory homunculus that we'll talk about very shortly. So... Here is a much more uh, detailed diagram where we can see the lower extremities are found on the medial aspect. The upper extremities in the face are found on the lateral aspect. And then, of course, the trunk here is in between. And, of course, here you have your thalamus on both areas. So here's an overview of the transmission in the dorsal column. So find some time to pause the video. Make sure that you understand each and every step of the way and the pathways that are involved here because this is very important for you to know because when we discuss certain lesions it makes it very easy for you to understand when you actually know the entire pathway so talking about the somatosensory cortex remember that the, co the cortex itself is going to be divided into 50 distinct areas uh, which are predominantly referred to as broadman's areas based on their histological differences so the central sulcus or the central fissure is going to be extending horizontally across the brain and forms a demarcation between the sensory and the motor area something I already explained so posterior to the central sulcus you have the sensory area anterior to the central sulcus you have the motor area so there are different areas on the brain that are given numbers which are known as broadman's areas so you have these different numbers as we can see now for now i want you to know about area number three which is the sensory area area number one which is a sensory area area number five which is a sensory area area number four here and area number five uh I, I, actually area number four area number six these are going to be motor areas okay so those are the ones that i want you to know but for the sensory areas i will mention them uh, very shortly so the sensory areas you have two areas somatosensory area number one somatosensory area number two so separate spatial orientations of the different parts of the body are going to be found in these areas 
it's uh, more extensive in somatosensory area one and uh, much more important than the orientation in somatosensory area number two. And much less is actually known about the function of somatosensory area number two. So the projections that uh, are going to be in the somatosensory area number one are actually required for the functioning of somatosensory area number two. But what we've noted is that if we remove somatosensory area number two, it doesn't have a significant impact on how somatosensory area one actually works. So what would happen if we were to actually remove somatosensory area one? It would result in loss of the following things. So the patient will be unable to localize discreetly the different uh, sensations in the different parts of the body. They'll be unable to judge critical degrees of pressure against their body. They'll be unable to judge the weight of an object. They'll be unable to judge the shape or the form of the object, which is known as astereognosis. Then they will have the inability to judge the texture of materials. And of course, there is a representation that is present within the brain, which is known as the sensory homunculus, of which different parts of the body actually project too. So the arrangement of the projection in the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe is in such a way that you have the body being represented in order along the postcentral gyrus, where you have the legs at the top, the head and the foot in um, the the head at the foot of the gyrus, rather, and not only is there a detailed localization of these fibers that form various parts of the body or represents various parts of the body in this postcentral gyrus, but also the size of the cortical representation also matters because each of the different parts are represented by different sizes inside the brain. Like, for example, you are able to do so many things with your fingers, but not so much with your toes. Why is that so? It's because the fingers have a much greater representation on the somatosensory area as uh, compared to the toes, for example. And the sensation across the lips is also much, much larger as compared to the other parts of the body. That's why you get much greater sensation from the lips than anywhere else. So on the homunculus, the cortical areas for the sensations from the trunk and the back are very small, while well, the ones that are coming from the impulses of the hands as well as the mouth that are concerned with speech, those are very high. So... Here is the sensory homunculus. As we can see here, we have the genitalia here in the medial aspect. We have the foot and the legs. You can think of it like someone who's sleeping on the brain. So you have um, the foot here. It's a huge representation. You have the trunk, not so big. You have the hands, as you can see, very huge. The finger is very huge. The face, very huge. You can see the size of the lips, very, very huge. So this is drawn according to proportion. You have, of course, the mouth here. Of course, the pharynx and the intra-abdomen. Then... You should have an idea of this and how to actually replicate this diagram and the general orientation of this diagram. Because on your exams, you may sometimes be asked to talk about the sensory homunculus. So remember that stimulation of various parts of this uh, sensory homunculus is going to be given rise to appropriate uh, sensations in these body parts. Like for example, if you stimulate the part of the hand, then you may get some numbness in the hand. You may get some tingling sensation, sometimes even a sense of movement. And um, this is actually done in chimpanzees to actually to do this. And then with um, fine enough electrodes, you can actually uh, produce relative uh, pure sensations such as touch, warmth, they've been cold by stimulating these different areas. And then, of course, the cells that are present in the postcentral gyrus are organized in the vertical columns, and the cells in a given vertical column are activated by afferents from a given part of the body, and they all respond to the same sensory modality. Then, what happens if we remove a part that is supposed to represent uh, in the cortex, or if you remove a body part that is uh, amputated and it's represented in the cortex. So it's very clear that the neural connections that we have in the body are not inert things. They are very dynamic. So they are ever changing relative to what the body is experiencing. So numerous studies have actually been done to actually uh, study this in many different animals. And what we have realized is that, for example, if a body part is amputated, like for example, you lose your middle finger, the part that was um set aside for the middle finger representation will actually start representing the adjacent fingers. So the uh, index finger and the 
other finger, the ring finger, are going to be represented by this part, such that you find out that the function of these parts is actually slightly enhanced. So if a digit, like I was telling you in a monkey, uh, if a digit is amputated in a monkey, the cortical representation of the neighboring digits spreads to the cortical area that was formerly occupied by the representation of the amputated digit. So conversely, if you actually, if the cortical area represented the digit is removed, then the somatosensory map of the digit moves to the surrounding cortex. So it's kind of like shifts and finds a way to adapt. Then let's talk a little bit about uh, somatosensory association areas. Remember, these are found in the parietal cortex, sensory areas number five and seven. And these are very important because they help us in deciphering deeper meanings to the sensory information that we're receiving from the somatosensory areas for, actually, for us to actually make pure sense of what we are receiving as an input. So it combines information that is arrived, arriving from multiple points in the primary somatosensory area to decipher its meaning. And it's going to be receiving information from the somatosensory area number one, from the ventral basal nuclei of the thalamus, as well as from the visual cortex and the auditory cortex, so that we can actually make sense of whatever we're seeing, whatever we're touching, whatever we're hearing. And then moving on now to transmission in the anterolateral column. Remember that everything that we've been talking about is mainly to do with the dorsal column. Now we're moving on to the transmission in the anterolateral column. Remember that the anterolateral column is going to be transmitting pain, is going to be transmitting heat, cold, crude touch, tickle, itch, and sexual sensation, which are pretty much primitive types of sensation. And the fibers are going to be originating mainly in the dorsal horn lamina, number one, number four, number five, and number seven. So number one, number four, number five, and number seven. And these lamina are where many of these dorsal nerve root um, fibers are actually going to be terminating after they enter the spinal cord. Then the anterolateral fibers are actually going to be crossing over almost immediately. Actually, immediately when they enter into the spinal cord, they are going to uh, synapse with the second order neuron and eventually the second order neuron will cross over to the opposite side and ascend in the contralateral anterolateral column, which is also referred to as the um, spinothalamic tract because it's coming from the uh, spinal cord to the thalamus. Then there are predominantly uh, two terminus or two destinations in which these pathways can go, the spinothalamic tract. So they can actually terminate throughout the reticular nuclei in the brainstem. So you refer to this as the spinoreticular pathway. Remember that the reticular uh, nuclei or the reticular activating system is what helps you to keep awake. So there are some impulses that can actually go and activate the system, which, which we shall realize that whenever someone is in pain, there's going to be activation of this reticular activating system, and this is going to help keep the person awake. So it's it's very difficult to actually fall asleep when you're in a lot of pain because of the same reasons. Then they can also terminate in two different nuclei complexes in the uh, thalamus, basically the ventral basal complex as well as the intralaminar nuclei. The ventral basal complex, like I already alluded to with the dorsal column, are the ventral postural medial as well as the ventral postural lateral nuclei. So remember that in general, the uh, tactile signals are transmitted mainly in the ventral basal complex, uh, terminating in some uh, degree in the thalamic nuclei, whereas uh, the dorsal uh, tactile signals are going to be terminating in the ventral uh, postural lateral nuclei. And then from here, the signals are actually going to be transmitted to the somatosensory cortex, along with the signals of the dorsal column. So it's where they kind of like converge. Then there's only a small fraction of pain signals that are actually just projected directly to the ventral basal complex of the thalamus, instead of actually the pain signals terminating in the reticular uh, or oh, instead, rather, most pain signals are going to be terminating in the reticular nuclei of the brainstem. And from there, they can actually relate to the intrathalamic nuclei. And um, so it means that pain can actually be processed at the level of the thalamus. I, I think I alluded to this much earlier on during the course of this review lecture. So here is a, a schematic. The pain pathway is very, very simple to actually understand. I won't even draw this for you because it's very simple to understand. I don't think it would be very, very difficult. So you have your first order neuron that's coming from the receptor. This could be a pain receptor. It could be a thermal receptor. This is going to be entering into the dorsal nerve root. And then it's going to be synapsing with the second order neuron, which is going to decussate to the opposite side and travel in the opposite contralateral, um, anterolateral column. And then eventually, as it passes through the brainstem, it's going to be giving up... Uh, 
collateral branches uh, collateral branches to the reticular system which is known as a spinal reticular tract it may also give some branches to the mesencephalon you refer to this as a spinal mesencephalic uh, tract and then eventually these are going to be terminating in the ventral basal complex giving rise to the third order neurons that are going to be projected into the cortex so pain pathway is actually a classical example that can allow us to explain the anterolateral column. So remember that the first order neurons are having their cell bodies in the dorsal horn are going to synapse with the thermoreceptors and nociceptors in the skin. The first order neurons are going to be synapsing with the second order neurons at the level of the spinal cord. Immediately they enter into the spinal cord. And then in the spinal cord, the second order neurons are going to cross the midline and ascend in the contralateral or ascend to the contralateral thalamus. Remember, contrast the difference. The second order neurons are going to be arising at the level of the medulla in the dorsal column. The second order neurons are arising at the level of the spinal cord in the anterolateral column. So here's a schematic of each stage that I'm talking about. And of course, in the thalamus, the second order neurons are going to synapse on the third order neurons, which are sent to the somatosensory cortex. So this is what I've been uh, talking about, the rest of the diagram. So I think this is pretty much self-explanatory. So here's a, an image to summarize um, the anterolateral column. I think with, there shouldn't be so much a, a challenge in explaining the anterolateral column as opposed to the dorsal column. So remember that pain is going to be activating both the primary and secondary somatosensory cortex. It's also going to be activating the cingulate gyrus on the opposite side of the stimulus. And in addition to this, the amygdala, the frontal lobe, and the insular cortex, insular cortex are going to be activated. And remember that there are two main types of pain. There's what is referred to as fast pain, which is often pricking. It's carried by myelinated A-delta fibers, group 2 as well as group 3 fibers. If you do not know what this is, please play the previous video, then you will know what these fibers are. It is of rapid onset and offset. It is largely precisely localized. And usually it's somatic in nature, so it's going to be coming from a somatic structure. Then the slow pain is usually burning. It's going to be carried by unmyelinated C fibers. It's usually aching, burning, or throbbing type of pain, which is often poorly localized. And of course, it's going to be of visceral nature. Now, before I actually close this chapter on the somatosensory system, before we discuss the lesions in the next video, it's very important that you know about referred pain. Pain can actually be referred from a visceral organ. Remember that the referred pain is going to be following the dermatoma rule. So remember that the skin has innervations from the nerves and each uh, seg segment or each section has a different innervation as I've shown you on this diagram here. These are known as dermatomes. So if you get an organ that has the same innervation as that of which is coming from that area of the skin, the brain is actually going to be interpreting the pain that is coming from the organ as coming from the somatic structure rather than that that's actually coming from the organ itself. Like for example, if you get pain that is due to ischemia of the heart, it's often going to be uh, going to be felt in the left shoulder. If you uh, get pain that's going to be... Um, associated with the gallbladder, it can be referred to the abdomen. If you have pain that is uh, associated with the kidneys, it can be referred to the uh, lower back and so on and so forth. You may actually look up some of these examples on Google about the different types of referred pain because this has become very important, especially when you get to your clinicals and the, you actually get a patient that presents you with central chest pain that is referred to the left side of the uh, shoulder, the left arm and the left jaw, then you may actually start thinking that this person could have a myocardial infarction or in layman's terms, a heart attack. So here's a summary of the two systems in a very, very summarized manner. So take your time to actually um, learn these systems and how to actually explain them and they are very easy for you to learn. So just some special considerations before I leave you off. So remember that when the somatosensory cortex of a human is destroyed, then the person loses most of the critical uh, tactile sensibility, but there is some slight degree of crude touch that is retained because remember crude touch is going to be carried by the anterolateral uh, column and it may actually be even processed at the level of the brainstem. Then it is also assumed that the thalamus as well as other lower centers have slight ability in discriminating tactile sensation like i already told you and even um, though the thalamus normally functions only as a relay center it actually also can process some of this information then loss of the sensory cortex has very little effect on one's perception of pain and only a moderate effect on the perception of temperature then the lower 
brainstem, the thalamus, and other associated basal regions of the brain are believed to actually play a very dominant role in discrimination of these sensibilities, and each spinal nerve innervates a segmental field of the skin that is referred to as a dermatome. I think I showed you the dermatomes in the previous slide. And of course, the different dermatomes can overlap each other to some extent. Uh, thank you for spending your time to listen to this lecture on the ascending pathways. I hope you actually learned a lot and you now understand the pathways that you learned in class. If you're learning this for the first time, I hope you really enjoyed the lecture. If you did, please drop a like and drop a comment to show some support. Share the link to a person that's studying neurophysiology at fourth year so that you may help them with their exam and for someone who's even preparing for exam. Do not forget to subscribe to the uh, channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notification every time I post. Thank you to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time.